Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you again. Uh, my name is Greg, and I'm the lead chaplain in Crisis Care Chaplaincy. And I get the pleasure of working with your pastor on a daily basis. And even though he and I are totally different people, look at life a little bit differently, still get along with that man. I, can, I consider your pastor one of my best friends. And uh, matter of fact, he texted me yesterday from the campground. Uh, it's funny, I get a call, I'm going to take this story back a little bit longer, about five, six weeks ago, I don't remember how long it was, right before he started, or right during his beginning of his his time away for rest, he gives me a call, he says, hey, Greg, I want to spend the afternoon with you, and I'm like, oh, great, yeah, that's fine, let's get together, and he goes, I'll pick you up, and he picked me up at my office, I said, where are we going? He said, I'm going to go look at a camper, and I want you to guide me through the purchase process. And so we went and we looked at a camper. I said, no, dude, don't buy it for that price. He, he bought it anyhow. Uh, so I got to spend a great time with him. And he's out, and I, I, I won't tell you where he is this weekend. You might even know, but he's camping right now, and uh, he's having a restful time. And uh, last time I saw him was Thursday night. We got together, and he's, he's looking refreshed, and he's looking great. And he's excited about coming back and getting back into the pulpit and getting back into ministry with y'all. And so he's having a good time. Keep him in your prayers. It's a pleasure to work with him. I, I stopped in here on Thursday and uh, met with the staff in, in the back there in the offices. And uh, it was just like, uh, it was just like, a, I don't know, it was like I kind of belonged here. And it's like, so I call this my second church away from the church I attend. This is my, this is my other church. And so uh, it, funny thing is, is, the pastor of the church I attend, his name's Matt Anderson, which is kind of funny because you have a Matt Anderson here and uh, totally the same person. I mean, they're totally ripped and muscle-wise and stuff. And, and <laughs> I know he's never been accused of having muscles. Okay, so, but I'm just teasing you, Matt. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to laugh, isn't it? Uh, just one person says it's good to laugh, so that's great. Now, we're going to have a lot of problems here this morning, church. You're going to have to you're going to have to loosen up a little bit if I'm going to preach here today. Uh, can I hear a yeah? yeah? There we go. Now we're going to get somewhere. That's, we're going to get somewhere. Well, all right. Here we go. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about crisis. And uh, no, this is not a message on the crisis care chaplaincy, but uh, this is a message on personal crisis because we all experience in our lives a variety of stressful events in our lifetimes. Have you ever experienced a stressful event in your lifetime? If you have, say amen. amen. So each of us have a unique way of dealing with those stressful events in order for us to maintain a, a very comfortable emotional balance in our lives. And, and when the usual coping mechanisms begin to fail, when we have a crisis, then what we do is we begin to look for different ways to cope with that crisis. Now, a crisis state comes into being when the new attempts to deal with the crisis begin to fail and when they fail, that turns us into a pre-crisis level of something that's called an emotional balance. And that emotional balance is off. So what is a crisis? Crisis is a state of feeling. It is an internal experience of confusion and anxiety to the degree that formerly successful coping mechanisms have failed and an ineffective decision and behaviors begin to take their place. Ineffective decisions and behaviors begin to take their place. As a result, then, a person in crisis begins to feel confused, begins to feel vulnerable, begins to feel anxious, afraid, angry, guilty, hopeless, helpless. And these precipitations are often altered uh, by, by memory distortions as well. Crisis can be a time of opportunity, but crisis can also be a time of danger in our lives. Now, so I believe that crisis is useful when it causes a person to go beyond familiar coping skills, whether those coping skills are uh, external or internal, 
and then begin to develop new skills to develop new skills that help them deal with that crisis. Therefore, becoming more competent and more autonomous in their life. A crisis can be dangerous, though, when that person becomes so overwhelmed with that crisis that the anxiety and the pain begins to take over their life and they begin to adapt their life in negative ways. Good mental health. Good mental health has been described as the result of a life history of successful crisis resolutions. Another word, a term that we use a lot in the chaplaincy for our agencies that we uh, spend a lot of time with, our firefighters, our police officers, we call this resiliency. Resiliency is the ability to bounce back from adversity. Now, there are two types of crises that will happen in your lifetime. Because, and understand this, it's not always if a crisis is going to happen, it's when a crisis is going to happen. Because crisis always happens. I love that song, that last song that we sang. It says, I might not be fighting Goliath, but I'm fighting giants right now, right? So we all have crisis in our lives. The first type is called a developmental crisis. It's a crisis resulting from a normal change in life. Puberty can be a crisis for some people, okay? Matt, you're a, you're a youth pastor. You deal with crises every day, don't you, with the teenagers as they're going through puberty. How about leaving your home, going off on your own somewhere? That can be a developmental crisis. Any first time, uh, anybody been married for less than a year here today? Crisis, right? We, we can have counseling later if you need some. But there's a crisis because you're learning each other and you're learning new things and, and you're developing things. And so that can be a crisis as well. Uh, other kinds of uh, developmental crisis. How many have a, a child that's under one year old? First child under a year old. Nobody? Second child under a year old. How many have children? Okay. Remember your first child? How many crises did you have when you had your first child? Tons of them, right? Developmental crises. Anybody just start retirement? Yeah, how's that going? Going great. No crises yet? I got a neighbor who, who's moving and, and has been retired for a while, but now he's moving into a home where everything is going to be done for him. This guy would spend hours on his yard. He, he'd go out first and he'd spray it, and then he'd go out and he'd trim it, and then he'd go out and he'd do the sidewalk edges, and then he'd mow it, and then he'd trim it, and then he'd spray it again, and he'd just, that's all he did every day, every week. He just took care of his yard. Now he's moving into a place where everybody does everything for him, and he told me, he goes, I'm already having anxiety because of the change that I'm going to, that's going to be taking place. I'm not going to have a yard to mow every day. I said, dude, you can come over and mow my yard anytime you want. I, I'm more than happy to help you with this crisis right now. So those are developmental crises. Changes that are a normal part of life that it can only be successfully trans, transitioned through as you learn to cope with each one of those situations. And, and that's what we do. We cope with those situations as we change in life. But then there's the other kind of crisis, and that's called a situational crisis, which is the result of an unexpected trauma in your life. Now, this unexpected trauma could be anything. It could be a, a loss of a loved one or, or a family member or a dear friend. It could be an illness. It could be a displacement. But whatever the case is, because of the unexpected shock of that crisis, one typically experiences these events. Those are, those are pretty stressful in a person's life. And that crisis state involves the breakdown of the normal coping behavior that may have been adequate in the developmental crises, but it's just not cutting it for the situational crisis, and the status quo of my life has changed. 
Now, any one of us can experience a situational crisis. Situational crises do not discriminate on anyone. They don't care who you are. They don't care what you do. They don't, cal- they don't care how old you are, what color you are. They don't care if you're male or female, married or single. A situational crisis will come into our lives at any time, unannounced, when we're not ready for it. My wife and I, we've been married some 35 years now, uh, and uh, she's, she's the children's director over at the church that we attend, uh, so she's not here this morning. She had to teach class. She wishes that she could have been here, but uh, we've had a ton of, of situational crises in our lives, and uh, the two of them that have had the biggest impact on our lives is the first one was when uh, my nephew was 16 years old, and he would, be, he would be about 30 years old. He's the same age as my daughter, my oldest daughter, Megan, who's here today. Megan, wave at everybody, would you? She's right over here. This is my oldest daughter, Megan. My, my nephew, Brandon, would have been the same age as Megan uh, was. But when he was 16, he decided to take his own life. He decided to complete a suicide, all because somebody was bullying him at school. And so he decided to take his own life. That was a situational crisis for myself, for my wife, for my entire family, for my kids. A situational crisis that we had to deal with. The second situational crisis that we had to deal with was uh, about 20 some years ago. We were living in a small town in Iowa. We were pastoring a church there in Iowa. My wife ran a daycare for our community out of our home. And uh, Debbie's daycare, and, and we, we had a, a, I don't know, she had about six, seven kids in the, in the daycare. We had one child who was about five months old. His name was Noah. And his mom, we were trying to get his mom and dad to come to our church and weren't having any luck. But we got him into the daycare and we're watching the kids. And my wife goes in to check on little baby Noah, right? And, and she looks at him while he's sleeping and, and his, he's breathing. His chest is moving up and down. She checks on him. He's good. She walks out. Ten minutes later, mom comes to pick up the baby. They go in to get the baby. And he had stopped breathing in that ten minutes. And he died of SIDS in our home. And I, I, was, I was out of town with my daughters that day. And I heard, I was a firefighter. And I heard the page go off on my radio. And, and uh, I heard my address called. And I turned around. And I drove uh, really, really fast. Faster than I should to get back home to be with my wife. Uh, because I knew that this was a stressful moment. And they did CPR in the child, and they air cared the child to University of Iowa hospitals, but the baby died. There was nothing they could do. It was a situational crisis that, that tore us up. It tore us up. And, and so I, t- I tell you that, that they happened to everybody. We were pastors of a church, right? They happen to anybody. They do not discriminate. And when those crises happen, those situational crises happen, they may trigger something that is called a personal crisis. A personal crisis. A personal crisis occurs when an individual can no longer cope with a situation. And this is preceded with the events that... that that are an extraordinary nature, and they trigger extreme tension, they, extreme, they, they trigger extreme stress in that individual, and that crisis then which requires major decisions or actions in order to resolve that crisis. And again, as I said before, personal crises are not new. Personal crises have been occurring since the beginning of time. However, I believe that we can prepare for personal crisis because they're going to continue to happen. Whether we like it or not, crises are going to take place. But we can prepare for them and we can even survive those personal crises when they come in our lives. And today I want to share with you six points, six tips to help you prevent or survive a personal crisis in your life. Six tips, six points to survive a personal crisis in your life. And if you open your Bibles, if you have them to 1 Kings, and we're going to look at 1 Kings 18, we're going to look at 1 Kings 19, 
And I know the I know the scripture of 1 Kings 19 will be up here on the on the screen here momentarily. But in 1 Kings 18:21, we see Elijah beginning to have a situational crisis in his life. And he tells the people in 1 Kings 18, he says, "How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. And Elijah then proposes a showdown, if you will, between his God and the people of Baal. And he says, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to see whose God is God. We're going to see who's really going to be the one who steps up when it calls for somebody to step up. He says, go get two bowls. Let's have two sacrifices And I don't want you to put any fire on those sacrifices yet. Keep the fire away. Whichever God answers us by fire and consumes the sacrifices, then that will be the God that we're going to serve. And if you go and read that story, you see that he's in a a crisis. And we find out that, that God answers that crisis. And God devours the sacrifice with fire. And then he has the prophets of Baal killed. Well, this made Queen Jezebel quite angry. And she said that Elijah was going to die. So so he goes from a crisis to another crisis, situational crisis, where Queen Jezebel is going to have him killed. And that is what caused Elijah's personal crisis. In chapter 19, verses 3 through 5, and we'll read that here As it comes up on the screen, there it is. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, For I am no better than my ancestors. And then he laid down under the bush and he went to sleep. Elijah was uh, in a personal crisis. He was afraid. The queen was after him. She was going to have him killed. He was afraid for his life. He was running for his life. And he was tired. He was so tired from running. And this fear and this tiredness caused him to become depressed. And not only this, and I don't mean to rock your world, but we see in this portion of Scripture here that Elijah was even having suicidal thoughts in his mind. Him being tired, him being scared, him being depressed led him to have suicidal thoughts in his his mind. He said that he prayed he might die. He was having an emotional, he was having a mental, and he was having a spiritual, personal crisis in his life. But what Elijah did next was the things that helped him recover and prepare for those personal crises. And that's the six tips that I'm about to give you to help you survive a personal crisis. The first thing that Elijah did, number one, he took time to rest. Take time to rest. Crisis is going to happen in your life. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you do. Understand that there are going to be times when situational crises happen in your life. And if you want to be prepared for those situational crises, then you need to take time to rest. What do you think your pastor's doing right now? He's camping, he's resting. He's resting. Why is he resting? Because he is preparing himself for anything that might come down the line in his future. He's preparing for a personal crisis. Oftentimes, we as as individuals, we do this. Sometimes we as Americans don't do this very well because we're 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 told, oh, we got to work, 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 and we got to do this and do that, and we've got to we got to keep being busy all the time. But there are things that we need to do that are important, and one of those things is we need to take time to rest. 
Well, that was one of those times when you should have said amen. When you are constantly living your life without taking time to relax and to rest, you are going to become tired physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, and that is not a good place to be. That is not a good place to be. It is hard for us to be productive and on the top of our game when you're not rested. You can't be a good employee. You can't be a good friend. You can't even be a good parent or a good spouse when you are emotionally, mentally, and physically and spiritually tired. It's hard to fight temptation to sin when you're not getting enough rest. We need to rest from time to time. We need to rest. And if you are struggling with a crisis, maybe, you're, maybe, it's, maybe it's not even a crisis. And remember, this, these tips are to prepare you for a crisis. But maybe you're having un, ungodly thoughts in your life. Or maybe you're having anxiety. Or maybe you're having depression. Maybe you're just a little bit discouraged. Maybe you're angry all the time. If your personality is changing and people are beginning to notice that your personality is changing, this could be a problem. And the result, uh, the reason that this is happening is because you're probably not getting enough rest. God created us as individuals to rest. We operate, studies across the board show that we operate best when we get at least six hours of sleep every day. At least six hours of sleep every day. Now some people can go on less sleep and some people can go on more sleep. I'm one of those more sleep people. Man, if I get nine hours of sleep, and I got nine hours of sleep last night, so I could go on forever today. But I'm not. I'm only gonna be a few more minutes. But when we get at least six hours of sleep, man, what a powerful person we could be. God even gave us a day in our lives when we should just sit back and relax and kick back. He called it a Sabbath. And honestly, that Sabbath could be any day of the week. I, 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 you can take a Sabbath on a Tuesday if that's your Sabbath and take that day on a Tuesday and take time to rest. Okay? First tip, take time to rest. Second tip that we see uh, Elijah doing in, Eli in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 is commit to a healthy diet. Commit to a healthy diet. Now, this is a hard one for me. I am a stress eater. And you look at me and say, bud, you've been in the stress a lot, haven't you? That's a stressful man up there. I just found out a couple weeks ago that, that my cholesterol is like three points higher than it should be. Not the good kind of cholesterol either. The bad cholesterol, the, the one that we get from eating uh, fried pickles and mozzarella sticks and all the good stuff, you know, uh, that's not good for you. And so they said, your cholesterol is a little bit high. You need to, you need to kind of take a look at that and, and make some changes in your, in your life. And so I'm like, oh, that means a diet. Okay, let's do it. Um, when Elijah woke up, he ate. And, and it, it tells us that he had some bread and some water in there. It may not be the best diet, but he ate. And back in those days, that was a good diet back in those days. So Because the bread was different there. It wasn't filled up with all sorts of bad things in it. So he ate. And he was still tired, so what did he do? He went back and he rested some more. And then after he rested some more, he got up and he ate a good diet again. I believe that food is a gift from God. Amen? Amen. I believe, and I, I've been taking a lot of gifts as much as I can. But, but food is a gift from God. And God gave us the right to eat and drink anything that we want to eat and drink. Somebody say amen. Thank you, God. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 says that even though we have the right to do something, we should never be mastered by that thing. So even though God says, you know, I, go ahead and eat whatever you want, we should not be mastered by that food and that desire to eat. So we need to find a healthy balance we need to eat right, and, and we need to take care of ourselves because in, a long, in the long run, 
honestly, a healthy diet in our lives is beneficial to us. It's beneficial to us mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. It's very beneficial to your life. And so commit yourself to a healthy diet. Now remember, these are just tips, things that you can do, okay? Number three, pursue a change of scenery. In other words, there are times in our lives when we should step back and do something different. Now, I'm not talking about big life changes here. I'm talking about something maybe that's a little easier. Like if you're stressed from day to day about something at work, then take a change of scenery and find a different route to get to work or to go home from work. Mix it up a little bit. See, if you're always doing the same thing, then maybe it's time to do it a little bit differently and change it up. After Elijah's strength was renewed, he took a little trip. He changed up his scenery. He went to Harob, the, the mountain of God. At times, for us to change up the scenery in our lives a little bit or do things just in a little bit different way, is going to bring more joy and novelty in our life than doing the same old thing every single day the same way. And it may be a big change, it may be a small change, but those small changes even break up the monotony in our lives and improve the brain's capacities and capabilities to deal with stress and to deal with crisis as they come. So we, we create new habits in our lives, and creating those new habits in our lives, positive habits, they boost our health mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. So change it up a little bit. Change it up a little bit. Uh, Debbie and I, we went and bought a motorcycle to change it up a little bit because it was just, you know, I was getting stressed. It's like, well, I need to do something just a little bit different. So I found a good deal on a motorcycle and we went and bought it and, and I could feel the stress levels begin to go down again because we changed up the scenery a little bit. And I'm not saying that you have to just sell everything and move to Hawaii, although that would be a whole lot less stressful than living in the winter in North Dakota. By the way, I saw the winter outlook, more snow than normal in North Dakota next, this winter. Just didn't mean to stress you out right there. Sorry about that. Take a, take a vacation this winter to someplace warm, and then that will help. Lay, change your scenery a little bit. Number four, renew your sense of calling and purpose. That's what Elijah did. How did he do this? He did this by spending some time in the presence of God. And in the presence of God, God asked Elijah, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And Elijah answered God, and in doing so, he found a revived spirit, his sense of purpose, his sense of calling was restored. Each one of us in this room, we are all born with a deep desire to live with a purpose and a calling. To prove this, you look back when you were young. When you were young, and this is, I, I know this is true in my life, maybe it's not true in your life, maybe it is, but when you were young, how many of you would dream of being something great and making a difference in the world, huh? Am I the only one? Yeah, quite a few of us. Most of us live our lives in constant pursuit of finding out why are we here on this earth. God, what is my purpose on this earth? We seek that, answer that question, God, what, what was I made for? What are you calling me to do? And a lot of the times was we're looking for this answer to this question a lot of the times we look for the answers in the wrong places. We look for our, our purpose in other people. We look for our purpose in society. We look for our purpose on Facebook or on Snapchat or on Instagram or on TikTok. That's where we look for our purpose at. And, and when we, we look for those purpose in those wrong places, for a while there it seems to make us feel good for the moment 
But when we look to God for our purpose, for the purpose in our lives, man, we find that we could change the world when we look to God. Because he has a purpose for our lives. He has a purpose that is so great. He has a purpose that is so powerful. He has a purpose that is so everlasting that when we get a glimpse of it, when we spend some time with him and get a glimpse of our purpose in him, we never let go of it. We hold on to that and we work towards that purpose. And so we need to renew our sense of calling and renew our sense of purpose. The next thing that Elijah did, and the next tip for you is number five, know that evil will not win. God sent Elijah back the way he came, and he reassured him that God was going to be victorious. And if you don't believe that God is going to be victorious, then read Psalm chapter 37. And you will see in Psalm chapter 37 that God says that he is going to be victorious. I'm just going to read the last two verses of that chapter for you. Psalm chapter 37, the last two verses says, But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. Let me paraphrase that one for you. He is your strength in time of crisis. He is your strength in time of personal crisis. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trusted in him. Church, step number five is very simple. Know that God has the victory. Know that the devil can't win. Know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Know that God is greater than anything. And if you renew your strength in him in step four, then you know that God cannot fail. You know that evil will not win. And I'm going to let you on a little secret. I cheated before I came here this morning. I went back to the book of Revelation, and guess what I found out? God wins. Come on. God wins. And when we're stressed out, we don't have to worry about it because we already know the end of the story. God wins. When we're in a personal crisis, we don't have to worry about it. Why? Because God wins. And if you've done those, other first, those first four steps and you followed those, then step five is going to be easy. And if you don't believe me, go read the book of Revelation. God wins. Be a cheater like me. Go look at the end of the book. God wins. God wins. And lastly, and with this, I'll call the worship team back up. Remember that you are never alone. You are never alone. God was with Elijah. During his entire life, he was with him. God anointed Elijah. God protected Elijah. God provided for Elijah. And God, God went even so far as to provide a helper for Elijah by the, by the name of Elisha, who came along to be a helper for him. And God promises each and every one of you today, if you turn to him, he promises you the same thing. He promises that he will be with you. He promises that he will never leave you alone. In, Isaiah, in, Isaiah book, in the book of Isaiah 41 verse 10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous hand. The author of Hebrews reiterates, reiterates this point by saying in Hebrews 13, 5, he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Church, in a world that is constantly changing, in a world that, where people are constantly leaving, whether it's in a, in a family or it's in a relationship or it's in a death, 
God's promise to us that he's never going to leave us is extremely encouraging. It's encouraging to us when we're afraid. It's encouraging to us when we're stressed out. Because Hebrews 13, 6 says, So we say with confidence, with confidence that the Lord is my helper. So I will not be afraid. What can mortals do to me? God promises us that he's going to protect us. He's going to protect us from the stress in life. And so I hope that you're encouraged today, knowing these things. Most importantly, knowing that God will never leave you alone. And I said at the beginning of this message, I said, it's not if a crisis happens, it's when that crisis happens. Remember that none of us are immune from crisis in our lives. John Maxwell, in Developing the Leader Within You, wrote this. He said, a study of 300 highly successful people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Helen Keller, Winston Churchill, Albert Schweitzer, uh, Gandhi, Albert Einstein, revealed that one-fourth of those individuals, 300 highly successful people, one-fourth of them had handicaps in their lives, such as blindness, deafness, or crippled limbs. Three-fourths had either been born in poverty or came from broken homes or at least came from an exceedingly tense, disturbed situation. And yet every one of those people succeeded in life. And I believe that people don't succeed in life because they were fortunate enough to be given a life totally absent of problems. In fact, I believe that it is because of their personal problems they faced that they became stronger survivors. Today, I've offered you six steps. Six steps to help you prevent or survive a personal crisis. Ben Franklin once said, failing to plan is planning to fail. I challenge you today to make a plan and determine that you're going to follow that plan so that you can prevent or survive a personal crisis. Now, there are six steps that I gave you. Do you have to focus on all six? That's going to be kind of hard if you have to focus on all six. What if we, took, what if we just took two? What if, what if you picked two of those six tips and focused on those? Which two would you pick? Which two? And out of those two, which one would you invest most of the time on focusing and improving? What are two attainable action steps? Something that you can do to accomplish your goals of improving. I hope that you decide today to survive personal crisis in your life. And you can do so by turning to God right now. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, the bad news is that we're all going to experience a crisis at some point in our lives. And some of us here in this room have already experienced enough crisis for one lifetime, and yet, God, you say you're not immune to any more. That's the bad news, God, that we're all going to experience personal crisis. But the good news is, God, that you have made a way for us to survive. Even though we're not fighting Goliath, God, we are fighting giants. And God, you've promised that you're going to be there and you're going to help us through those times. So, Father, I pray for this congregation and those listening online. And I ask you, God, to give them the strength to overcome crisis in their lives by turning to you, by putting you first, and by picking up any one of these six steps, God, today and focusing on those things that you've called us to do and that you've given us examples in your word to do. Father, be with this congregation, those watching online, and help them now. In Jesus' name, amen.